Good morning, everybody. This is the Mac Road Church of Christ. We are in Luke chapter uh, 13 and verse 34 in our Luke study. So let's go ahead and have ourselves a prayer. Lord God and Father in heaven, we just praise you and thank you for all that you do for us. We're so thankful for the blessings that you provide. We're so thankful for the forgiveness of our sins that we have in your son, Jesus. We're so thankful, Father, because you have uh, provided for us and taken care of us in this physical world, even though we know that the world uh, will end in futility for us as far as the physical life is concerned. We're so thankful that we have a spiritual life uh, that you have provided for us, that you will bless us and carry us past uh, our physical life. And we pray that as we study, that we might understand how much you love us and care for us. We pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us so that we might learn the things you'd like us to learn from the book of Luke. We praise you and thank you for all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we are in Luke, and we're in Luke chapter 13 and verse 34. We're actually at the end of a section, and if you take a look at your little notes that you have on Luke chapter uh, 13, and if you go to your outline that you have, uh, you notice that in the very last part, uh, you had in Luke 13, 31 through 35, Jesus foretells his suffering in Jerusalem. And along with that, Jesus then also points out that he is going to mourn over or he mourns over Israel or he laments about Israel. And that's one of the things that we're covering right now. We're going to be in that little section that deals with Jesus uh, uh, dealing with, with Israel and those activities that are going on. And so he, we're, we're in Luke chapter 13 and verse 34, and that section actually started here in verse 31, where it says in Luke 13, 31, just at, uh, just at that time, some Pharisees approached, approached saying to him, go away, leave here for Herod wants to kill you. And he uh, said to them, go and tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow. Uh, and the third day I reach my goal. Nevertheless, I must journey on today and tomorrow and the next day, for it cannot be that a prophet would perish outside of Jerusalem. So that's where we ended in, in our study last week. And we pointed out that basically what Jesus was saying was that he understands that he is going to go to Jerusalem because right now, if you remember, in our little um, map up here, sorry, Jesus is up here in Galilee, and so he's on his way down, and the, the Pharisees up here are trying to get Jesus to come down here to Jerusalem where they have more authority and more pull and more influence because they don't have so much up here in Galilee, and so they're, they're claiming that Herod wants to kill Jesus, and they're trying to make Jesus run down here to, to Jerusalem, where he's going to then be under their control. But Jesus points out and tells them that he still has some work to do. He's going to be there for another three days before he finally comes down here to Jerusalem, and so he, he lets them know that. Now, he also says that he understands that the reason why he's going to Jerusalem is because he's going to perish in Jerusalem. He's going to Jerusalem because they're going to end up, uh, uh, he's going to be delivered into their hands, and they're going to end up killing him. So as a result of that, as a result of Jesus saying that in the last part of verse, 30, uh, verse 33, where a prophet uh, w would not perish outside of Jerusalem, uh, he then laments over Jerusalem, and he talks about how he, he feels so bad for Jerusalem because of their activity and what they're going to do. Uh, in Luke 13, 34, he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. How often I wanted to gather you, uh, gather your children together just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not have it. Behold, your house is left to you desolate, and I say to you, uh, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So as Jesus is looking towards his journey to Jerusalem, and ultimately his death in Jerusalem, he's then uh, 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 considering the consequences to Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem. And of course, Jerusalem is the, like the, the capital of the Jewish community. And so it's not just to Jerusalem, but it's to, to all the, the, the Jewish community. Uh, he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. So he, he in, in this little talk, he points out that Jerusalem has always been like this. This isn't something new, but they've always been like that. And it's, it's interesting that he says they're the ones that stoned, that killed the prophets and stoned those sent to her. So as God tries to, in Israel's time, 
get them to follow him and to serve him. He sent them prophets. He sent them uh, uh, messengers. He sent them individuals to tell them to get right with God. Uh, over here, uh, uh, towards the end of, the, of Israel, the, the ten northern tribes, uh, he sent, uh, uh, he sent uh, uh, Isaiah and other prophets to warn them, hoping to get them to, to turn away from their sins so that they could be delivered, but they weren't. And then over here, when Judah was alone, he sent them prophets, he sent Jeremiah, he sent Ezekiel, he sent other individuals to try to get them to turn so that they might not be destroyed, but they didn't listen. And so Israel, the ten northern tribes, went off into Assyrian captivity, and then later on, Judah went off into Babylonian captivity. So this isn't something new. Them killing the prophets and them killing those people that were stoned to them is not something new. Uh, I, I don't know why it is, but it seems like sometimes religious people don't want to listen to God. And I find that quite interesting uh, because, you know, I, I, I try to do what God says. But it's interesting that a number of, of religious people and people that are religious, they promote their religion instead of promoting what God says. And rather than them listening to God, they reject what God says. They reject whom God sent. They reject the apostles and those messages sent by the apostles. And so that's still going on today. It's not like it ended during their time. And so in verse 34, he says, How often I wanted to gather you, your children together, just as a hen gathers her brood under her wing, and you would not have it. So that, that's not just referring to when Jesus was here, and Jesus is trying to preach, them at, uh, preach to them and bring them under God's wings. The idea of bringing them under God's wings is under God's protection. Uh, that's the way um, uh, birds would usually protect their, their children or their, their, their offspring when they're young. Uh, that is, they'd put their their they'd open up their feathers and put their feathers around that around their their chicks, so that some other bird or some other predator wouldn't see them, and so they would protect them. And that's what Jesus is basically saying. He says, "I'm trying to protect you. I'm trying to take care of you. I've called you." Every time God sent them a prophet, yeah, uh, the prophets, as you and I know, were sent with messages of doom. But the reason that He sent them with messages of doom is so they could repent. God didn't have to uh, send them a messenger in order to destroy them. He could just destroy them. But he sent the messengers. The purpose for the messengers was to try to bring them under God's care and under God's, God's guidance. Uh, but instead, they rejected the prophets. They killed many of them. Matter of fact, all of them. Uh, and so Jesus is pointing that out to them, that he's wanted to bring them. God wanted to bring his people under his wing. Now, in the, in the nation of Israel, or in the national picture, that scene with God trying to bring Israel. In the world picture, God is trying to bring everybody under his wings. God is trying to bring all people under his, his care and under his protection. He's trying to help us. When God created Adam and Eve in the garden, he was trying to protect them by telling them, don't eat the fruit, uh, because the day you eat the fruit, you're going to die. But rather than them listening to God, they listened to Satan, and then they had all this trouble and all these problems that resulted uh, because they weren't under God's care. So God has always been trying to get his people under his care so that uh, he can take care of them, and yet they, they wouldn't do it. Now, those of us who are trying to do what God says, uh, honestly, uh, those of us trying to do, we run under God's protection. We, we care about what God says, and we, we try to do what he says. And so he says to, to Israel, because that's who he's talking to, remember the context under this is still chapter 11 and the end of, the, of chapter 11 where he said they were trying to figure out a way to kill him. They were trying to figure out a way to trap him, if you remember that. And so uh, this is still under that context when Jesus is really basically uh, condemning the, the Jewish community of his day and that generation because of their unfaithfulness to God. And so he says in verse 35, Behold, your house has left you desolate, and, uh, and I say to you that you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So Jesus says to them that you're not going to see me. When he says see me, does that mean that, Jesus, that, that they're going to actually physically see Jesus? What, what, what does that expression mean here when he says to them, uh, uh, that you will not see me until. What does he mean by that? So is this talking about judgment, the end of time? When he says you will not see me? No, the idea, the idea of see me is the idea of to know. To know him. Or to, or to 
have a relationship with him. And he says, you're not going to be able to see me until you what? Well, it says here, until what? Until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You see, the problem with them looking at Jesus, they didn't think he came in the name of the Lord. That was the problem. And they're not going to see him. They're not going to recognize him. They're not going to acknowledge him until they come to understand he's sent in the name of the Lord. Yes. Right. So, so to, to see me means to recognize me, to acknowledge me, to because right now they're, see, they're physically seeing Jesus. As a matter of fact, as he's saying this, they're physically seeing him, but they don't see him. They don't recognize who he is. They, they don't understand who he is. So they're not going to understand who he is until they recognize that he's the one who's coming in the name of the Lord. And the idea of the name of the Lord means that he's coming in the character and the authority of the Lord. Yes. That's right. If they had really accepted who he was, they would not have crucified him. But since they didn't accept him, since they didn't see him, since they didn't see him for who he really was, then they're going to crucify him. And that's why he's lamenting, because they really didn't see him. But, you know, that's also what they did over here in the prophets. When God sent them prophets, if they really, really believed those prophets were from God, if they really believed that there was a God and he sent them prophets, what would they have done? They would have never killed the prophets. But they kill the prophets because they don't recognize them as actually coming from God, or at least not to the point where they need to follow follow what they say or follow what they do, okay? So they weren't seeing the prophets as somebody that, that was sent by God. They, they were seeing the prophets as just uh, uh, another group of religious, religious preachers. They had a lot of different religious preachers during that time from the idols and all of them. They had their own little, their own preachers and they kind of recognized them all the same. So they didn't follow God's preachers and they didn't follow Jesus here because they didn't see him. Yes, Pumpkin. Well, right. Uh, Jesus, Jesus was coming to die. That's true. But that doesn't mean because he was coming to die that you couldn't accept him. The, the, his, his 12 uh, apostles accepted him. They recognized they, they wouldn't have killed him. So it was possible to see him. See, they believe that the apostles uh, believe that Jesus came in the name of the Lord. Remember when Jesus asked them, uh, who do men say that I am? And some of them, and they said, well, some say you're a prophet or you're, you know, you're, you're, you're John the Baptist raised from the dead or you're Elijah, you're one of those guys. And he said, but who do you say that I am? What'd they say? You're the Christ, the son of the living God. You, you, you have come in the name of the Lord. So they accepted him. So it's possible to accept him, even though, yes, he, he, he was going to be crucified but it was possible to accept him, but you had to recognize him as coming in the name of the Lord. You had to recognize that he wasn't just coming up by his own authority, but he's coming in the name of the Lord. He's coming by the authority of the Lord. And so what happens in 70 AD to Jerusalem? They fall. Why do they fall? Because they didn't recognize Jesus coming in the name of the Lord. That's why, and they didn't accept him. And so therefore, uh, uh, the Bible says that... that uh, God was going to destroy Jerusalem, and that's why Jesus is lamenting here. He's lamenting over Jerusalem. You might say, well, you know, they need to die. They don't believe in Jesus. You know, how, how arrogant of them. Jesus doesn't feel that way. He says, oh, man, you guys know what you're doing? You guys understand the consequence of not believing in me? Do you, do you, do you understand what's going to happen? Jesus lamented over them. He was, he was sad. He was, he, he was lamenting over the fact that they weren't going to believe in him. He wasn't saying, God, strike them dead. You know, that's kind of the difference between uh, Jesus, if you remember, and the sons of thunder. Remember, remember the sons of thunder? They, uh, they had gone to, to Samaria, and Samaria wasn't going to accept Jesus. And so James and John said, Lord, do you want us to send fire down from heaven and blow them up? Well, th th there is, but that doesn't mean he likes it. But, th but that doesn't mean he likes it or he, or he enjoys it. God is not pleased with the death of the wicked. Just like hopefully you're not pleased in punishing your children. Do you like punishing your children? Do you enjoy it? 
You go, oh, great, I can't wait for him to do something wrong so I can spank him. <laughs> right. We, 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 we like the outcome because the outcome is hopefully the, the, the kid behaves, right? But, but we don't like the discipline. That's what, that's what Jesus pointed out here. Jesus, Jesus didn't come down to, you know, blow people up. Jesus is trying to save them. So he's lamenting over them. And that needs to be our attitude, too. Some of, some of us want to see an individuals, you know, just get rid of these guys. They're the, they're the scum of the earth. God laments over them. Yes. Right? Uh, yes. Well, they had they had a lot of sins uh, in there. They they just they just didn't have that. God uh, uh, God told uh, Is, um, Abraham when he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, "I have heard of their wickedness. I, I have, uh, you know, their wickedness has has been told to me." And so you can think of the angels telling. Uh, God about all the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah, and so He came down to actually see if it was that bad, and that's why they're they're destroyed because their wickedness was really bad. It it, it wasn't that God didn't give them a chance. God had given them lots of chances. Matter of fact, Lot was there, and Lot had been preaching to them. Lot had been talking to them, but they didn't care. Uh, just like just like Lot talked to his sons, his uh, his future sons-in-law that were supposed to marry his his daughters, and they didn't pay attention to him either. So God had given them a, a good deal of time. They just didn't. They just didn't take advantage of it. All right. So, oh, and by the way, here, even though Jesus laments here in about 30, 33 A.D., it wasn't until seventy A.D. that God finally brings judgment on on Jerusalem. Why? Because He's given them a chance to repent. He doesn't want them lost. God doesn't want people lost. He wants people saved. He wants to give people an opportunity to change and repent and come to Him and believe in Him. Now, chapter 14. I, I believe chapter 14 is really going to explain to us why it is that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And he's going to do this by giving us some, some little stories and some parables uh, that we need to look at and understand what's going on in them in order for us to understand why it is that Jerusalem is going to, to, to be destroyed. In chapter 14, verse 1, he says, uh, by the way, on your papers, it's chapter 14, if you want to turn there. Uh, it says, uh, it happened that when he went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, they were watching him closely. And there in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. And Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they kept silent, and he, he took hold of him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which one of you will have a son or an ox fall into a, a well and will not immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day? And they could make no reply to this. And so Jesus gives them this, this event, or at least Luke puts, it, puts this event in here, and I believe, like I just told you, that I believe that this event is in here to help us understand why it is that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. So it says in verse 1, and it happened that when he, he went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, they were watching him closely. So why was it that they invited Jesus in to, the, to this uh, Pharisee or this leader's house? So they could see if they were, so they could trap him, so they could catch him. They, they weren't concerned in him doing uh, good or bad. They were trying to trap him. So they invited him on the Sabbath day to eat bread. In other words, they, they were going to go to his house, to this uh, Pharisee's house on the Sabbath day, and they were going to eat. They were going to eat a meal, and they were watching him closely. So so they're 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 looking to figure out a way to criticize him. Now, uh, is that? What we as a group of people should be concerned with is looking to see if we can criticize other people, looking to see, looking to see other people's sins, 
and, and, and examining them if, if their sins are, are, you know, if they have sins so that we can go and talk to them about their sins. It, it, that's, what, that's what the Pharisees were doing. That's what they turned religion into. They turned religion into looking at one another to try to examine one another to make sure that you're towing the line, that you're living the way they want you to live instead of understanding it's a relationship with God. All right. Uh, now, uh, it says, and it happened that when, when he went into the house of one of the leaders of the first on the Sabbath, so they were doing this on the Sabbath day, right? It says, to eat bread, they watched him, they watched him closely. Now, why would they watch him closely? Well, look at verse 2. And there in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. Now, uh, just exactly what is dropsy? It, That's right, yeah. And, and a lot of times you see that with people that have like really swollen legs, they're really fat, I mean, you know, real big. That, that's, what, that's what dropsy is. Uh, and, and so it's something pretty obvious, it's something that you can see, it's something that, that uh, you know, as medical people, that, you know, they have to do a whole lot in order for that person to actually get some comfort. They usually wrap them really tight with, with wraps in order to help, help the circulation and stuff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and water pills and stuff like that. So, but during during Jesus' day, there wasn't a whole lot of there wasn't a whole lot of remedies. But they could see it; it was quite obvious. And so, I'd suggest to you that the reason that they're watching Jesus closely is because this guy's there, and they know what Jesus is going to do. They know how Jesus is. It's kind of like Jonah. Why didn't Jonah want to go preach to Nineveh? Because he knew if they repented, God would what? God would forgive them. Well, why'd they have this guy there? Because they knew if Jesus saw him, he would heal. He would heal him. He, he, Jesus was concerned about the person more than he was concerned about their religious traditions uh, that they that they were uh, observing um, instead of what God really wanted to, to, them to observe. So there's this man in front of them suffering from dropsy, and so Jesus turns to the to the people that he's uh, invited to, and he and Jesus. Uh, answered and spoke to the lawyer and the Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Now notice that it says, and Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers. So apparently they asked him a question. Apparently they, they, they might have said to him, you know, Jesus, can, you know, is it lawful to heal this guy on the Sabbath day? Because apparently they asked him something because it says he answered them. It, it, yes. Okay, because Luke, right. Yep, so, so um, Luke, because he was a doctor, is more concerned about the, the symptoms and the, the disease, right? And so that, that's what he deals with. Uh, but all I want you to notice is that they had asked Jesus something, because why would Jesus answer if they never said anything to him? So, so he, he's answering a question, and so that, I, you know, I'm kind of figuring the question is, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? I'm, I'm pretty sure that that seems to be what they were asking him. Now, uh, why were they asking him that? Well, they, they weren't asking him that because they didn't know what he was going to do. They knew what he was going to do. They were asking him that to trap him. They were asking him that to catch, to catch them. So in, in order for Jesus to answer them in a manner in which uh, they can't say anything about his answer, he, he asked them a question in verse 32, or in verse 3, sorry. It says, And Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? So he says, Is it lawful to heal? Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or not? Now notice verse 4. But they kept silent. But they didn't want to answer him. They didn't want to say no, because if, if they say no, then it's like, we're going to condemn Jesus. If they say yes, then they're, they're not going to agree with their friends over here, and they're going to get into trouble. So rather than doing anything, they just kept silent. Verse 4, and he took hold of him, of the man who had dropsy, and healed him and sent him away. So he took hold of the, the man who had dropsy. 
he healed him and sent him away. Now they're all looking at Jesus, right? And so he says this in verse 5. And he said to them, because he knows what they're thinking, which one of you will have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? So what does he tell them? Okay, they would do whatever they needed to do on the Sabbath day in order to save something that was, that was valuable to them. Their son or their oxen that had fallen into a ditch, it's valuable to them, and so therefore they would do whatever they needed to do in order to save that ox or save that son, and they would pull him out on the Sabbath day. They would do it on the Sabbath day. Well, why would they do it on the Sabbath day? Why, why wouldn't they wait and pull him out on Monday? I mean, on Sunday. He may die. He may die in the pit. The, 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 the ox may die down there. So you, so you need to get him out as soon as you can, or else he may die. So what difference does it make if he dies? What difference does it make to them if he dies? It hurts them. It, it's a value to them. If your son dies, it will hurt you. If your ox dies, it's going to cost you money. It was something personal to them. Now, why is Jesus telling them that? Why does Jesus say that to them? They don't care about the sick guy. They only care about what affects them. They don't care about what affects God. What affects God is this person is sick. It's one of God's creations. It's one of God's children. God needs to save him. God needs to deliver him. And on the Sabbath day is a good day to do it. Not only that, but because the Sabbath day is a sign of what? Who remembers what the Sabbath is a sign of? It's a sign of rest, but it's a sign of what? God's going to take care of them. So what better day than for Jesus to heal this man with dropsy than on the Sabbath day to prove not only that God cares about him, but that uh, Jesus is also God who's doing the work of taking care of people on the Sabbath day. Yes. Yep, he, he said the Sabbath is made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Matter of fact, that's not just about the Sabbath. That's a, about all of God's laws. Yeah. All of God's laws were made for man. Man wasn't made for the laws of God. The laws of God were made for man. See, there's a different emphasis. In other words, the purpose for the laws is to help man. Okay? Now, how come a, a policeman can drive 50 miles an hour down this road here, but you and I can only drive 40? The speed limit says 40. Well, he can if his siren's on. Why? Why can he do that? Yes, that's right. He's breaking, he's breaking the speed limit law, but why can he do it? Because he's going to emergency. The law is designed to help people. It's not designed to hinder people. If he goes 40 miles an hour, he might not get there in time to help the person that needs help. The guy who's being robbed or the, or the lady that's getting beat up by her husband or whatever, he might not get there in time if he has to go you know, 40 miles an hour and stop at every light and stop at every stop sign, he might not get there in time because the laws weren't designed. Uh, 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 man wasn't designed for the laws. The laws were designed for man. Right. And that's what, Je that's what Jesus is pointing out by that statement. And that's what Jesus is trying to get them to understand here. And that's why Jesus doesn't condemn them for pulling out their son on the Sabbath day. He doesn't say to them, you guys shouldn't do that. There's no place in there where, where Jesus said you shouldn't pull out your ox on the Sabbath day or you shouldn't pull out your son on the Sabbath day. He doesn't, he doesn't get upset uh, for them to do that. He gets upset because they're more concerned about their property than they are about God and what God is concerned about. And that's why he's saying that. And that's why in verse 6 it says, and they could make no reply to him. I mean, what could they say? Nothing. Nothing. God cares about his own just like they care about their own. And they would, he, they would take care of their own on the Sabbath. God's going to take care of his own on the Sabbath. Now, the thing that they fail to see is that God is taking care of his own on the Sabbath. They fail to see Jesus really is God. So, 
he's going, he's going to give them a couple of parables. And these parables are designed to help them understand the, the problem that uh, they have uh, in their thinking. So in verse 7 he says, And he began speaking a parable to the invited guests. See, he's still at these Pharisees' house. He's still there where he healed this, where he healed the man with dropsy. It says, and he began speaking a parable to the invited guests when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor at the table, saying to them. So as Jesus goes in, and, and, and before everybody apparently sits down, you know, Jesus sees this man with dropsy, and he heals them, and that's the very first thing that he did. And so after he does that, people are like moving around to figure out where they're, where they're going to sit, and so they, they have these tables set up, just like just like in your house, if you're if you're going to have a, a dinner party or something, you know you have a you have a table, uh, and, and uh, 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 people are mulling around trying to figure out where they're going to sit. But if you are a leader, if you are a ruler, and you have a table set up uh, in your office or whatever where people are going to eat, uh, do people just sit where they want? No, you generally assign people according to their rank or according to their importance in, in an official gathering, right? Okay, well, this leader was having a party or a, a dinner party at his house, and, and the people are mulling around trying to figure out where they sit. Jesus sees that, okay? You know, you, you can imagine they're kind of looking at each other going, are you going to sit there, or do I sit there, or do you sit here? Where you? They're, they're looking at what you and I would call the pecking order. You know the pecking order? Yeah, that's what they're looking. That's what Jesus sees them doing because they're more concerned about their pecking order than they were about the man with dropsy. Verse 8, he says to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, uh, give, give your place to this man. And then in disgrace, you proceed to occupy the last place. Now, most of us have gone to wedding receptions, right? Who gets to sit at the table with the bride and the groom? Usually the wedding party. That's who usually gets to sit there, right? Maybe also the mother and the father of the bride, and, and, and they might get to sit there. Uh, uh, but but everybody else has their own little tables. So only certain people s sit up there. And so Jesus is saying, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. He says, don't go around looking for honor. You see, in their in their view of religion, that's what they consider religion. Who's honorable like me? Who's honorable like me? In in, in this in this religious pecking order, where do I where do I rank? Okay, you know, if, if Bill and I go somewhere and, and uh, Greg and, and Loretto and I go somewhere, uh, who, who's going to get to sit closest to the, to the guests? Me, Loretto, Greg, or Bill? Could you imagine us arguing about that? About who's going to get to sit next to him? That, that's crazy, but that's exactly what they're doing. That's what they're looking at. You, you look at religions where they have a hierarchy, and that's what they have. They have the guy on top, and they have people under him, and people under him, and people under him, and they have this hierarchy chain. That's, that's the way they looked at religion here. Jesus says, that's not what we do. It's not about honoring ourselves. Yes. Oh, right. Oh, I know. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yep. Uh, that, that was quite interesting when, when we saw the ceremony for him being uh, becoming king, right? And all the dignitaries and everybody had their own little spot to sit. Yeah. That's, what, that's, that's the way they looked at religion. Yes. Now you go to uh, a lot of the other churches, too, and you got other seats that's up there with him. Right. Right. Yep. Yep. And so they so they're looking for places of honor. And he says, but don't do that. 
because what's going to happen if you take a higher seat and somebody more important than you comes along and the the person who invited you comes and says, no, no, that's not your seat. You, you sit over there. This is his seat. This is this this guy's more important than you are. How are you going to look? You're going to look at you're going to look humiliated or disgraced, as it says here in verse nine. And he who invites you both will come and say to you, give your place to this man. And then in disgrace, you proceed to occupy the last place. Now, I'd suggest to you that there's more to hear than just this story about a wedding feast. Who was supposed to be, you might say, we can put it like this, the honored guests in the kingdom of God? Who were supposed to be the first people who, who got to be invited to the kingdom of God? It was the Jews. Wasn't the gospel preached to the Jews first? Right? Wasn't it, wasn't it preached to the Jews first and also to the Greeks? They, they were supposed to be the first ones? But what happened? Were they given that on honorable position? No. They weren't given that honorable position. Who, who was it given to? The Gentiles. Yes. The Pharisees were parts, were the religious leaders of the Jewish community. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, that's what they had the high standard attitude. It, it, it would be kind of like, you know, uh, I grew up in the, uh, you know, I was raised in the Catholic Church, and so it's kind of like if you go to the Catholic Church, you know, the, 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 pri the priests have this high position, and people, you know, view them like, wow, they're priests, and, and, and they're the ones who can perform this, the, the service, and they're the ones who can give the Lord's Supper, and they're the ones who can, you know, and you have to go to them, and they're, they're like held up. That has nothing to do with religion. I mean, it has nothing to do with Jesus. It might have to do with religion, but it has nothing to do with Jesus and, and being one of God's disciples. And that's what he's, that's what he's pointing out. So what's, this, what's supposed to happen? Verse 10. But, but when you are invited, go and recline at the, at the last place so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. So he says what you should do instead is seat is sit, sit yourself in the lowliest places. And then if the person wants to honor you, he can come and move you up higher. And at least that way it'll look like you're being moved up instead of being moved down. Yes. <clears throat> right. 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 And one of the reasons they would do that is because if there's empty seats in the front, they want to make it look like it's full. And so they would. <laughs> and so they would get people from, like you said, the nosebleed section to fill the seats down there. And of course, you'd feel honored if you were one of those people that you got to sit there. Right. Because those are those are expensive seats. And so verse 11 says, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. You have to put this in the context of their religion and the way they viewed things. Jesus eating at the at the religious leader's house. All the other all his other religious leader friends are looking for places of honor to sit. They're all trying to figure out whether it fit in here. And Jesus is going, you guys have no idea what it means to be one of God's people. He says, you guys think it's about positions and honor and, and people calling you respectful greetings in the marketplace and being, and being told by, by, or being called by other people that you're the teacher, you're the rabbi, you're the leader. God goes, no. It's about being humble and letting God exalt you up, letting God lift you up. If you need to be lifted up, God's the one who's going to do it, not you. And, and not your religious group is going to do it for you. So that's one of the parables he gives them which is part of their attitude that's going to cause them to be destroyed, that's going to cause Israel to lose their position as God's, as God's nation. Luke 14, verse 12. And he also went on to say to one who had invited him. Now he's talking to the, to the leader, right? When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors 
Otherwise, they may also invite you in return, and that will be your repayment. So as Jesus walked into this, to this dinner party, you know, this, this, they're going to have this luncheon or whatever they're going to have. There weren't just common people around. Who did, who did the leader invite? All of the people that are going to give him recognition. He invites all of the high officials. That's who he invites to his party because he knows that if he invites them, then they're probably going to reciprocate and invite him to their, to, to their dinner parties. And, and Jesus says, when you give a luncheon, don't invite those people. You want, you want to know what the kingdom of God? Don't invite them. Well, who do you invite then? If you're not going to invite them, who do you invite? He said, don't invite your relatives or your rich neighbors. Otherwise, they may invite you in return, and that will be your repayment. So he says, if you invite somebody for dinner and you expect them to invite you, that's your repayment. I mean, you had a good dinner and you had your friends over, but what good did that do you in the kingdom of God? Did that, did that build up treasures for you in heaven? That you just invited your friends over and then they invite you over and so you just, have, you just eat with your friends all the time and, and with the people at church and they invite you and you invite them and that's who you eat with and so we have this nice little party among ourselves. That's what they were doing. Okay, so who do we invite? Verse 13, but when you give a, a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Are you kidding? You know how dirty their wheelchairs will make my carpet if I invite them? Do you, do you know that their walkers are, are, you know, stuck in the mud sometimes and you're, you're gonna, you want me to invite them to my house and get it dirty? Do you know that sometimes they, they haven't taken a bath for a while and they might not smell nice? You want me to invite them? That's right. <laughs> yes. Right. That's right. That's exactly right. He says, but when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. Well, why? Verse 14, and you will be blessed. Well, why am I blessed if I invite the, the lame, the poor, the blind? Why am I blessed if I invite them, but I'm not blessed if I invite, you know, my, my friend who's of equal status with me? Why am I not blessed if I invite him? He says, for... Uh, Verse 14, and, and you would be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you. So wh why are you going to be blessed? When are you blessed? Okay, well, when we die and God is blessed, but we're blessed when we give up our resources and don't expect anything back. Now, why was it that they would pull out their sons and their oxen on the Sabbath? Because they were persons and they would cost them something, they would lose it, right? Why don't they help the poor? Why, why don't they help those individuals? Well, no recognition, but that also cost them. You see, they save their son and they save their oxen because they don't want to lose that value. So they're certainly not going to share it with the poor. They're certainly not going to give it up for individuals that aren't going to pay them back or give them recognition, or help them in their status. And so therefore, they only invite people who are going to help them in their status and in their position, uh, and that's who they're going to invite. He says, and you will be, uh, in verse 14, 14, and you will be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. When, are, when do we get paid for all those dinner parties that we give to poor people? Here? Are we looking for recognition here? No. Are, are we looking for payment here? No. In the day of, res in the day of resurrection. In other words, God uh, is going to repay us uh, with giving us what we cannot pay him back because we have given to people and we don't expect them to pay us back. Yes. Right, they, they, they didn't have the kind of chairs you and I have today where, where we have a chair and we sit upright 
at the dinner table. The dinner table's like uh, three feet high, you know, and we're all there. Uh, they had very low tables, and so they would put cushions around the tables, and so people would actually lay down or recline on the cushions while they're eating in front of them. And that's why one of the, one of the necessary customs was when you invited people over, you're supposed to wash their feet. Because if you didn't, their feet are sticking up while you're eating, and you don't want to see ugly, dirty feet when you're eating. Because, because their feet, you're going to see their feet. It's not like ours. You have our feet underneath the table, and people can't see if you got dirt on them or not. And that's, that's the idea of them reclining. So they're reclining because their tables are really low, and so they have to get low. Okay? That's right. <laughs> exactly. All right. Now, verse 15, look at what he says. When one of those who were reclining at the table with him heard this, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. So one of the people that was hearing him says, that's great, man. It's going to be great for those people who get to, who get to eat in the kingdom of God. Okay, You're going to get to, to, to be in the kingdom of God. Now, do you remember when David became king and David wanted to honor Saul? Remember what he did to honor Saul, who was the previous king? Remember what he did? He had Mephibosheth eat at his table. Remember Mephibosheth? He, he was one of Saul's relatives. And so David invited him over to sit at his table. And so every time the king would eat, Mephibosheth would be there. And basically, he was taking care of Mephibosheth and was, was feeding him and taking care of him and giving him everything. Okay, And that's what this man is referring to, or that's the idea when he says, uh, uh, when one of those who were reclining at the table with him heard this, he said to him, blessed is everyone who eats bread in the kingdom of God. He says, it's going to be great if you eat bread in the kingdom of God. If you're one of those people in that position where you get to eat at the king's table, it's going to be great. Yes. Mephibosheth. And you can't remember Harold's name? <laughs> I know. <huh? laughs> By the way, when, when we eat the Lord's Supper, who are we eating with? Jesus. We're reclining with him and eating at the table. We're eating at his table. That's what the bread and the, the cup is about. And, of course, what we're remembering is his sacrifice for us. Uh, I have no idea. I know he believed Jesus was a special person, but whether he believed him or not or trusted in him or believed that he was coming in the name of the Lord, it doesn't really tell us. But Jesus gives a parable to them to answer what he says or to, to reply to what he says. So he says, blessed is everyone who eats in the kingdom of God. So Jesus isn't, isn't saying that's not true, but look at what he says. Verse 16, but he said to him, a man was giving a big dinner, and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent his slaves to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is ready, ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. And the first one said to him, I have bought a piece of land, and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I am going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have married a wife, and for that reason I cannot come. And the slave came back and reported this to his master. And then the head of the household became angry and said to his slaves, go out at once into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor, the cripple, the blind, and the lame. And the slave said, Master, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the slave, Go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in, so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those who were invited shall taste of my dinner. Now, what started this little parable? Well, yeah, but verse 15, what's... Yeah, verse 15. Blessed everyone who's going to eat bread in your kingdom. They're going, yes, yeah, it's going to be great in your kingdom. Jesus goes, you're not going to get there. That's what he's telling them. He's saying, you're not going to make it. He said, let me give you a parable. Let me give you a story. 
He says a man was giving a big dinner and invited many. And the dinners, at the dinner hour, he sent his slaves to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is ready. God was preparing a, a Messiah for them. He was preparing a dinner for them, for them to accept the Messiah. God had been doing that ever since the beginning of creation. The children of Israel were supposed to be the first ones to come. They were the ones who were invited. They were the ones who knew about the invitation. They were the ones who knew the promise. And they come over here to Jesus. And do they follow him? Do they believe in him? Do they come to his dinner? No. No, they don't come. So what does he do? What, is it, what does the slave do when he says, I went and invited them, but they had all these excuses. Some of them bought farms. Some of them had married a, a wife. Some of them had oxen. And, and, and the people you invited didn't want to come. That's the Jewish community. The Jewish community didn't come. He invited them, but they didn't come. So this guy's saying, blessed is everybody who gets to eat at your table. Jesus goes, yeah, I invited you guys, but you're not coming. You don't accept me. So what did the slave do? Or, or sorry, what did the master do when the master heard that the invited guests weren't coming? He said, "Go out and get the cripple, the blind, the lame." Now, remember, the, remember the story. You invite your friends; they repay you. His friends didn't want to come. They weren't going to give him what friends usually do. They weren't going to repay him. So he goes out and he gets the sla- the, the blind, the lame, the cripples. He invites them in, right? So he invites all of them, and then there was still room. By the way, the blind, the crippled, and the lame were probably, in the story, from the Jewish community. So the, his, his regular guests that were equal to him in status and, and finances and those kind of things, they didn't come. So he invites the people who would appreciate his dinner. He invites the poor, the blind, and the lame. They don't get to eat that well. They're poor. They're blind. Nobody takes care of them. They're not invited to parties. So these guys would come. These are the, the Jewish people who, who believe in Jesus, okay, who, who would come to Jesus. By the way, who does come to Jesus? Those that are broken. See, they're the ones that come to Jesus, the ones that are broken, the ones that are blind, the ones that are lame. We come to Jesus because we're sinners. But in this context, that, that would be the Jewish community. Uh, that would be the, the uh, uh, sinful people in the Jewish community who needed Jesus. They would come to the dinner party because they're invited. But then he said, there's still room. So what does he tell his slave to do? Go out in the highways and the hedges. In other words, go out of our region. Go out of our, our territory and invite other people to come. Gentiles. So he's inviting the Gentiles. And so who's going to come in? So who comes, who, who's going to come and eat at this dinner when, when, when the Jewish, one of the Jewish religious leaders that was eating with Jesus says, it'll be great when we're eating in, in your kingdom. What does Jesus reply to him? You guys aren't coming. The blind and the lame of Israel are coming. Those sinful people who are crippled, who, who, who need uh, recovery from sin, they're going to come. But there's going to be a few of them, and there's still going to be room. So we're going to open it up to the Gentiles. We're going to open it up to everybody. So you guys think you're coming, and you're not going to make it. Yes. Right. Right. Yep, he invited them. And that's the promise that God gave Abraham, right? The promise to Abraham was not just that the Jews would be saved. What was the promise to Abraham? All the nations of the earth will be saved, right? That's who can be saved. And that's what this little parable is about here. This, this little parable is about that they're, the Jewish leaders who are at this dinner party, because that's who's there, they're not going to make it. The poor, the blind, and the lame of Israel will make it. The, the sinful people who know they're sick and they know they need a Savior, they're going to come to, to follow Jesus. They're going to they're uh, trust Jesus can forgive them. But the Jewish leaders aren't. They don't think they need Jesus. And then the Gentiles are going to be invited in. And they're going to get to come in and eat at the table with Jesus. Yes. But still, he's telling them that he's giving them a chance to repent. Right. He, he, would, like for them, he would like for them to repent. Right. Now... What's his point? 
down here in verse 23. And the master said to the slave, go out into the highways and along the edges and compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. Now, does that mean that there's not going to be any Jews that believe in it? No. What it means is that in this context of these religious leaders where Jesus is at, very few of them are going to come to him. Very few of them are going to accept him. Very few of them are going to believe in him and trust him to the point where they will follow him and serve him. Right? All right. So any question then down that far? Because that's where we have to stop. Well, that's right. They, they, they couldn't see. Yep, they, they, they spiritually couldn't see. All right, let's have ourselves a prayer. Lord God and Father in heaven, we just praise you and thank you for every good and perfect gift. We thank you so much, Father, for the blessings with which you have blessed us, and we're thankful that you're helping us to try to understand your character, Father, the character of your son, Jesus, so that we might become more like you, that we might not be people who are religious, Father, but that we might be people who follow you and who have your spirit within us. We pray that you help us, Father, not to look for recognition. We pray that you help us to use those resources that you've given us to help others, whether to come to you or to feed them or to clothe them or whatever we might be able to do. We pray, Father, that you would help us to uh, understand what it means to be your people. Pray that you help us to make an impact in this world as we strive to do what we can to please you. We ask that you forgive us for our sins and help us in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.